Houdini 18.5 just dropped, and while browsing through the What's New section in the Help, a few fixes and additions caught my eye. And in this video, I want to talk about some new features, upgrades, or plainly fixes covering SOPs, modeling, and rendering in Karma. So to get started, I'm going to load in a file, dive in there, and select my file here. And for this, I downloaded a 3D scan of a log from Manuel's site, exterior.com. And in this case, I want to uncheck show sequences as one entry and select my high resolution scan FBX here. Takes a while to load in and we see nothing. That is because this log is too big and not centered. So let's immediately drop down a transform, wire this up and click move centroid to origin and scale this back to a hundredth of its original size, like so. So we get this log pointing roughly along the Z axis. And let's just grab the transform handles and let's transform it, rotate it a bit so it points along the Z axis a bit better, like so. And the first new feature I want to talk about is the path deform here. So that has two inputs, one for the geometry I want to deform and one for a spine curve. So a curve along which Houdini tries its best to deform this geometry onto. To test this, let's drop down a circle. We can see this is just a full circle here. Let's set its type to be a polygon, increase its division so it'll end up having 128 points. And let's set this to be an open arc ranging from zero to maybe 250. So that's this circle here. Let's wire in the second input slot of the path deform and highlight this one. And after a bit of cooking, we see this. Our initial log deformed to part of this circle here. So let's head into the path deform and see what kind of settings we have to dial this in. So the first two sliders drive how this geometry is stretched along the curve. In this case, Houdini tries its best to keep the original length of our geo here. So if we increase this, we can see our whole geometry is now stretched. And if we decrease it, our geometry looks a bit compressed. Also with the curve position, I can offset this mesh along the spline here that I feed in here. And also when we set this to a negative value, you can see we are in an area here where there is no spline. And we can see this behavior, what's happening here with those two checkboxes. So that's my start behavior. And I can set it to be either clamped, so it cuts this here, or set it to be clipped. And while visually looking very similar, the detail is when I zoom in here. Now with this set to be clipped, we're just cutting off the geometry where it exits the spline that we use to deform it. However, when I set it to clamp, we can see it just compresses all the polygons and points which are outside of my circular spline here to be at the end. So that creates quite some geometric mess here. So I'd rather tend to use clip in these cases. Or the default setting is to just extend this so the geometry is mapped along my spline's last tangent here. Let's reset this to zero. And also what I can do is I can deform this mesh here by scaling or rotating it. So if we enable scaling, we can well, scale this mesh and make it look a bit thicker. Or we can drive the scaling by using a ramp. So when we drag this down here and maybe add a point in here and drag down the endpoints, we can see what we're doing here. We are creating this scale ramp, which in our case gets mapped over the whole spline here. So maybe I wanna decrease my circular radius here, the uniform scale to maybe 0.25. And now I can see the effects of this scaling by ramp. So the center of my geometry is really thick with the ends being rather thin. Let's disable this again and maybe increase my circular radius to 0.3. Yeah, like that better. Similarly to what we've done with the scale, we can do the same thing with the rotation. So if we enable rotations, we can first dial in a base rotation. So the whole geometry rotates around the spline or I can enable the rotation with that ramp. So we can add a bit of twist like this. So now this log here is twisted in itself along the spline. Finally, if you want that, you have a rigidity control, which lets you set a group, which will not get bent along this path deformer here, if you need that. In the caption align tab, you can specify how your geometry is, well, being captured, aligned. That means in which orientation Houdini expects your geometry to be before it tries deforming it onto this spline. In our case, the forward direction is set to Z, which is the default which neatly coincides with the main direction of our log, which is along the Z axis here. If I set this to, for example, X, you can see this isn't doing much as it's trying to deform the log along the wrong axis. The up direction specifies uh, which axis is pointing upwards on our original mesh. So as this 
Scan has come in here quite nicely. It's already pretty well aligned with its Y axis pointing up. So no need to change that in here in the path to form. However, our up vector on our curve here is set to be Y by default. So this axis, however, in our case, this is pointing towards Z. So let's change that. Change the curve up control from Y to Z axis here. So this is a bit more like what I was expecting. Let's dial this in a bit and create a nice spiral here. So with my circle selected, I'll let this range from 0 to 720. So that's two revolutions. And then I'll append a point wrangle in which I'll write a few short lines of vex to create my spiral. But before that, I would like to have an attribute on my curve that I just created ranging from 0 at the curve's first point to 1 at the curve's last point, which I'm going to create using a resample node, which goes in between the circle and the point wrangle. And I'll just uncheck maximum length segments and check curve view attribute. So this is going to create a point attribute ranging from 0 at the first point to 1 at the last point of this curve. And now I'm going to use this in here to scale my position. So my current point position is my current point position times my curve view attribute. However, this starts at zero here. My curve view is zero. So if I want to push that outside a bit, I'm going to use a fit zero to one, which expects a value ranging from zero to one, like in our curve view, and remaps it to some other value. In our case, 0 0.05 as a minimum and 0 0.2 as a maximum, like so, ending up with a spiral that looks like this. Let's feed this into the path to form and highlight it. And this curve is really too small for this log. So let's go into our circle here and increase the uniform scale maybe to one. And in our path to form, let's use the X axis of our mesh as an up vector here, resulting in this neat twisted log. So before we talk about rendering this, I want to add a bit of hair or fur in those areas where there's moss on this log to make it look a bit more realistic. And for that, we're going to use a map called a vegetation map, and we're going to use it on this mesh directly. So after our path to form, I'm going to attach an attribute from map node. By default, it's got this silly UV grid. Let's point it to our texture, which in our case was provided in the downloads. So just dragging this down here, I find this vegetation map here. Hit accept. And all those white areas are areas where there's moss growing. And into those areas, I want to scatter a few points, which I'll then use to create fur. So instead of exporting this to a color, I want to export this to a density attribute. And it's going to be a float, which I will then use in the newly created scatter and align node, which is a bit like the old school scatter node, but on steroids. So let's highlight this here and set the point count method to number of points which allows me to directly enter a number of points, which I want to see on this surface here. In this case, we are seeing that these points get scattered somewhat uniformly across our whole mesh, not taking into account this density attribute that we created using the attribute from map. To change that, let's check density here and let's call our density attribute density. So now it's looking at this attribute that we created using this map here and only scattering points in those areas. I want to increase the point count to maybe 64,000 like so. And those will be the roots of our moss. To create a tiny piece of moss, I'm just going to use a line, which I have pointing along the Y direction. I'm going to scale it back to a length of 0 0.005. So really, really tiny. I'm going to give it eight points. And let's just highlight this and zoom in on it. So here we are with those eight points. And I'm just going to use a point jitter to offset those points a bit. Let's just dial back its scale drastically, 0 0.002 maybe. And I want to have these random values only along X and Z, not on the Y axis. And now I can dial in my seed until I find something that I like. I don't know, maybe something like this here. And I'm going to wire this into a copy to points. Line goes into one, the scatter points into the other slot here. Let's highlight it and again, frame it. Let's maybe get rid of these point displays here. And you can see nothing. And that is because scatter align by default does create a P scale attribute, which is set to zero. So under the attributes tab, let's just disable the P scale here, or even better, let's not disable it, but let's use an attribute randomize. Set this to P scale. It's one dimensional. It's just a single float. Let's set it to range between 0 0.2 and 0 0.6 and wire this into our copy to points. And now we can see we have randomly scaled scattered moss, which is pointing away from our mesh surface. However, all those individual moss lines are oriented in the same direction. That means they are rotated in the same direction along its normal. And previously changing this would have involved doing some linear algebra, some vector math or downloading mops. However, as of now, we can just head over to the scatter line here. And in the orientation tab, 
on the one hand, dial in a random cone orientation, so they wiggle a bit within this angle here, but also you can dial in a random rotation around the normal. So you can see they're kind of twisting around themselves, dancing around themselves. And this in combination with this cone angle here makes this whole thing look really random and organic. Finally, after those wires have been generated, this hair, or fur, or whatever you want to call it, I'm just going to attach another point wrangle in which I'll set the wires P scale to something really small like 0 0.0002 and set the hairs width to the same value. I'm always forgetting if the render engine is looking for P scale or for the width attribute to render those hairs. Like so. Let's attach a null to this. Call this one out underscore moss. And by the way, let's drag this up and up here after the path to form. Let's also attach a null. Call this one out underscore log. So I think now we are ready to render this using Karma, which has seen some substantial bug fixes and a few upgrades, which we're going to do in the next video. Just to keep in mind, path to form, a really nice way of deforming some mesh along a spline, and the scatter align, an updated upgraded scatter node, which now allows you to generate orientation and scaling attributes. And if you like what we're doing and want to support us or gain access to more in-depth courses, consider becoming a patron of ours. And to everyone already supporting us on Patreon, a huge thank you. Without you guys, all of this would not be possible. With a very special thank you going out to Patrick Fillion, Important Looking Pirates, Rafik Anadol, and Chris Hebert. Thanks so much, guys.